Hello everybody. Thank you all for being here. Today, today's interview with the masters, we have Shannon Beaumont. Um, she teaches the animal drawing class. So registration is open right now. Please check it out if you're interested in learning how to master drawing animals. And um, yeah, without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Shannon. All right, let's share my screen. Everybody see a bunch of cows? <laughs> yes, I can see it. <laughs> Especially this guy right here. You're rolling a bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great that's from a That's from an artist. Her name is uh, Rosa Von Hoot. Excuse my French. Uh, but she is fantastic animal uh, animal painter, so I'd highly recommend checking her out. One of my favorites, I've seen this at the Orsay Museum in Paris and was just blown away. Wow. How do you spell her yeah. last name? Oh, no. <laughs> no. no. That, um, <laughs> that one, I'm going to have to, I need to Google it really quick. It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Sorry to put you on spot like that. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. It's H E U R. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, she oh, she's such a wonderful there's another one, the the horse fair is quite famous, this one at the uh New York uh museum. And this one is fantastic. I, oh. oh wow. The, oh the power and energy blows my mind. Yeah, I have seen that painting. But if you're in New York City, definitely check it out at the Metropolitan Museum. I sat in the room, I think, for like 40 minutes just staring at it. <laughs> anyway, this is Rosa, fantastic work. Let's get started out with some old masters. All right, so... Um, what I can start out with is just a thing about the process. Um, I do, um, and I'll talk about this one with the uh, recently that was in the Missouri Department of Conservation magazine, and these are the thumbnails I did for the uh, the art director. Um, so they usually do six six to eight uh, thumbnails is usually what I do for an illustration, and the specs were that they wanted the eastern cottontail rabbit. Um, for a hunting article, and they wanted an action pose. And that's the cool thing about working with the magazine is they want a lot of action in the animals. Mm -hmm. And so I did the uh, poses from different angles. They wanted either a winter scene, and I just kept it really simple um, due to the deadline um, with uh, just snow and some grass. Uh, they also suggested that I do like brush so I thought maybe this, this rabbit here is running into a little bit of the uh, brush or a, an evergreen tree. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the process. They chose number three, um, the flying rabbit, super Superman rabbit here. And so what I did was um, sent it to them. They picked it, and they, they said that they wanted it flipped. Um, so before I go into an illustration, I usually do a bunch of studies for photographs. And a place I highly recommend to collect photographs is Pinterest. Mm -hmm. And I usually make a folder just with uh, pictures of the animal I need to draw either for the, like the zoo or for the uh, client or for students. Um, so Pinterest is fantastic. Um, and I can show you, you, some of you are probably really familiar with uh, Pinterest. This this site has it saves me so much time, so I would just recommend it. You can make a, a folder, and you can just oh, yeah. I can't praise this place enough. Yeah, so just a bunch of animals, but there's the like some stuff for uh, private things. So there's my rabbits. <laughs> That's awesome. Down I'm there. Following you. Um, yeah, I really like funny animal faces. <laughs> <laughs> just, just like, 
especially horses. Horses make some really funny faces. <laughs> I've seen this before. Um, so Pinterest saved a lot of time. I did studies in my sketchbook, and then I went on to the final illustration. All I did was I took this image right here, and I just flipped it. You just crop it, and I just go up to print, and I print it out on a size um, I want to transfer to a Bristol board, vellum Bristol board, and I have a light table, so that was a really easy transfer. Mm. Um, so it's going, yeah, it's just taking a digital, like Photoshop or something digital and then using it towards your advantage um, for uh, transferring things traditionally. And then um, this is the final illustration right here of the rabbit uh, jumping away. <laughs> but uh, again, they wanted very simple and uh, very, oh, some, a little bit, uh, little bit graphical, I mean, not, not really graphical, incredibly simple, I guess, more um, economic, uh, much more economical um, with, the, with the strokes and the placement of the elements and the composition. Um, simple, and the rabbit, of course, has a lot of information in it. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, process I took for the rabbit illustration. What was your time frame and, um, for this? Huh? What was your time frame for this illustration assignment? Well, what happened was is they gave me they gave me a month to do it, but I had other things planned uh, for freelance work with courses and um, mentoring students and also like illustrations for the zoo that would pop up, and then falling ill in the middle of that didn't help. Oh, no. So I ended up having two weeks for it. Okay. Wow. Yeah, and that, huh? Uh, I just said wow. Yeah. Um, so it went by very quickly, um, but it, it was one of those things. You get a month time frame, and the thing is, stuff just happens in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was one of those where I I had it all. I was like ready to start doing it, and then all this. All these things were all these things were planned, and then things started popping up, and then you get ill, and it was like, well, I still have time, and I was able to do it in the time frame, turn it in on time, uh, make the client happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this all in pencil? Yeah, this is a combination of graph wood pencil, um, black wing, and ebony pencil. Very nice. And I usually go in with the graph woods because they don't smudge and they're very hard. The lead is, is very hard. And then I go into a softer lead after that. Okay. Um, earlier on your Pinterest, uh, you had your animals organized uh, through like scientific names. Is there a reason why you did that? Um. I, I guess it's, I'm kind of nerdy. <laughs> I just, I, when, when I got, when I started getting into anatomy and learning the, uh, the names and the Latin names, um, it's just one of those things that stuck with me. And to organize the animals, it's just, it helps me a little bit more. One, to push myself to learn some of the Latin names mm -hmm. instead of just putting like dog. <laughs> You know, <laughs> um, and it can get it gets very specific, and I like that um, about the about the classifying things in Latin. I see. Cool. Yeah. It, anyways, because <laughs> I, I like making life really hard on myself. <laughs> That's good yeah. practice, though. Yeah. But I never, I never took a Latin class, and most of the stuff um, to help with the pronunciations, I got a lot of help from my mom, who is a nurse. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I had to take the anatomy test in university, she really helped me out with uh, understanding the locations of things mm -hmm. and giving me those. Um, oh, 
In German, it's called a donkey bridge, and I'm really sorry. Mnemonic device. Oh. Um, yeah, and it just, it's one of those things, she had these little, these, she had just these little things she did that helped her with her anatomy that helped me immensely. That's cool. Yeah. Those, those little mnemonic devices just, that's, that's pretty much what helped me. And it's, it's really stuck. That was, that's the important thing with learning is it, it stuck with me. Mm-hmm. What kind of right. uh, what kind of paper did you use for those rabbit drawings? The uh, sketches or the uh, final or just both? Uh, both. Okay. Um, the thumbnails here. Let's click out of that. Um, the thumbnails are actually on the Cottonwood sketchbooks, mm-hmm. and I'm a really big fan of the Cottonwood sketchbooks. There, I have a small one. And those guys are fantastic. The paper is really smooth. Um, I'd highly recommend checking Cottonwood out. And the final, uh, the final illustration is done on the Bristol board vellum paper. Okay. The Bristol board, uh, the the way it interacts with pencil, there's just something about it that makes me really excited. <laughs> It, I don't, I, don't I, I just get really excited when I put that pencil down and start sketching on the paper. I'm like, oh man, here it goes. <laughs> it's, it's on. <laughs> yeah. Let me do something else really quick. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, guys, I'm just getting over a cold that wanted to hang on for, like, about three weeks. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm glad you're feeling better. Yeah, it's all that all those people from Oktoberfest. <laughs> <laughs> it's all their fault. They brought all these germs. <laughs> do you do most of your commissions traditionally? Um, yeah. Do you, like, give them the original, too, if you do? Uh, if it's in the contract, yes. With the Missouri Department of Conservation, if I had won the government contract, which would have made me the illustrator of the magazine, they do more of me, they hire me in more as a freelancer um, instead of me as the in-house illustrator. Mm-hmm. And that was a government contract, which is a whole, oh my God, that, that, was, a, that was an adventure in itself. I think the contract was about an inch thick. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So that's just, oh. Anyway, I filled it out. I didn't win the bid, but they were like, hey, let's, we, we still want to work with you. Mm-hmm. And um, in the original contract, it, is re- it says that I am required to send them the original. Oh, Everything I do, but because I didn't win the bid, I keep my original work and then I can sell it. Mm. Yeah, but for like the Munich Zoo, um, no, I do not um, usually have to give them, I don't give them anything, I just send them a file and they will put it on the uh, information displays for the animals. Okay. Yeah, um, traditionally it really depends on the job. Um, for the signs for the Munich Zoo, like, don't touch the animals. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of don't touching, don't pick up animals, don't feeding animals signs. <laughs> <laughs> and for the, <laughs> for the, I'll, I'll just show you. I did one recently. Uh, don't, it says don't touch the sloth. <laughs> It was so funny when I got this project. I, I was laughing when they sent me, like, can we have this illustration? Let me see if I can find it. Um, but that one, um, yeah, that was a funny one. Uh, yeah, here you go. Um, for, for a sign like this, I do it usually in, um, yeah, there's the second one right here. I do it in uh, Photoshop, just uh, digitally. 
because it's easier if they need something fixed. Mm -hmm. And it saves me time. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a face. There was no way, I was really trying hard to make the sloth not look too derpy because they have these little beady eyes. Yeah. And I had to, what I did is I just increased the size of the pupil and that helped out a lot. But um, for this one, what happened was the, the, the image they picked was actually with the sloth's mouth open. And so I did that one first, and they were like, no, we don't want that because it makes it look too vicious. Could you close the mouth? And this took, it took me only like, oh, geez, like 20 minutes to fix it up. Mm -hmm. But that was, and, oh, but that's because it's, an, it's, it's a digital image. And it's easy to make those fixes. Um, when it comes to the information displays, um, a lot of it is done traditionally uh, because that fits to the style they want uh, for the information displays. So I can find one here, the uh, Bornean Bearded Pig. It's Botschwein in uh, German. And this guy, this guy gets a lot of attention, and I, I like him a lot. He's, he was a fun one to do. That's cool. Yeah, but this is done uh, pencil, and it was just it was done on a uh, just a nice um, nice sketching paper. Yeah, they got some they got some serious hair there. <laughs> they, they that's what they wanted, and they the specs they asked for, and the specs were um, you know a quarter view. Uh, turning towards a profile view, and they wanted it clear, um, the tusks, they wanted the tusks clear, and they also wanted the, um, the pretty much the, the beards very clear on the illustration, on the sketch. Mm -hmm. Do you do um, on-site watercolor studies of animals? And if you do, how long Ooh, yeah. does it end? The watercolors, oh, there are some I will spend only about like 20 to 40 minutes on, and there are some that I will spend uh, three to four hours on. Okay. And you, understanding a little bit about the animals you're painting um, and where they like to hang out and what time of day they will rest really helps. Mm. So a good example is the uh, Pazwatsky horses, uh, the, the wild Mongolian horses. Those guys um, at the Munich Zoo um, eat in the morning, first thing at 9 o'clock. And then after that, they usually um, kind of walk out. They'll, they'll dust themselves a little bit. And then they'll, they'll just kind of hang out, kind of go back and eat some more. And during the time around 10 o'clock uh, to 1 o'clock, they're usually really relaxed. And that's a good time um, to go and paint, especially if you want to do like a longer painting. Um, and those, I would just recommend that you have either your pot of tea or coffee with you, especially if it's cold. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that one, those, um, um, I don't know if I have them on this computer, unfortunately, but I do enjoy doing those uh, on-site watercolor, um, watercolor images, uh, watercolor paintings. They are, they're some of my favorite to do. Yeah. No, I don't think I have it. Well, a lot of stuff here is um, uh, demos. Maybe. No, sorry guys.
I'm just going to start sketching an animal doing something. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're doing these um, sketches, what is, when you were first learning how to do them, what was your, like, main concern? Um, uh, could you repeat that? So when you first started doing these, like, animal studies or sketches, what was your, like, main concern with the, with the sketch? Like, what was your focus? Um, I can actually show you that right now. Um, I want to start over. The big one is, um, is the flow and getting the animal to look fluid and natural. And that's what I do usually through the gestural. So if I want to draw, like, a cat, you know, and what I'm doing, guys, is I'm just, I actually will keep my pencil on the paper the entire time. Um, another way to approach a gestural is to pull in that nice action line, really get the spine in there. And what you're doing is you're getting a really nice beauty curve in there. Mm -hmm. a nice, it's like a nice S curve. And then the next thing I'm concerned about is the legs. And what I'm doing here is it's a combination of the gesture and also the construction shapes. And this is me drawing through um, while doing the gesture. So here, I'm going to pull up this leg. It's nice and natural looking. You know, have some lift on the other side. Get that rib cage in there as well. And with a predatory animal, you're going to get more room in the lumbar region here. It's a lot longer than, like, if you're drawing a cow or a horse. Put the back legs in. And I'm pulling, like, maybe it's walking. Another thing I think about is uh, the straights against curves. So I'm working with the gestural lines. <laughs> yeah, CSI, think of the television show CSI Miami. Okay, it helps. <laughs> yeah, that especially with all those the sunglasses and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just gonna just uh, get that nice gestural in there. And I, what I want to do is I want to make sure that it feels natural. Are things getting stiff? Um, are the legs feeling natural? Is it is it a natural movement? Am I avoiding am I avoiding symmetry as well? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is is the animal just like is avoid this where the animal is just like this where all the legs line up everything is just kind of symmetrical. I want asymmetry. I want things to counterbalance one another. And that means like the uh, contraposta, where where's the where's the weight, where's the weight, and where is the lift, like say of the shoulder blade, where's the lift of the pelvis? How does the pelvis turn in the space? Mm -hmm. Okay, and this was the big one, um, and a concept that I learned through the California artists like Joe Weatherly and uh, David Coleman. Um, I got out of university and a lot of the stuff I learned in university was it was a good university but I I wanted to do what Joe did um, and I bought his book Animal Essence there and the whole thing with having fluid sketches that are light that have life and character um, with animals and not just painting you know what is exactly in front of me. That's, a, that's something important when learning art. You know, you want to you wanna paint a still life, you want to learn how to draw with charcoal, you know, but I wanted life, I wanted movement. And those, those were the guys I went to, and the books, I, the, the books I purchased from them were incredibly helpful. And <laughs> this is another thing I learned is when you get out of school, keep learning. Don't just stop. <laughs> don't, don't stop learning. Always learn. Every day is a school day. <laughs> yeah, especially with art. 
Oh my gosh, yes. It, it's always like be open, be curious. Um, and when I got out of school, I wasn't amazing and I needed to really work to get better um, so I could find jobs, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was the, that was the one thing that uh, in university uh, one of the professors warned us about is like the, the number one killer of the artists is getting out of school. Mm. Interesting. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be that. I, w I really want to do this. Mm -hmm. But you can see with the, the sketch, you know, I can pull up the knee a little bit higher. So this is the sketch where I have, I have flow to it. There's, there's movement. There's counterbalance. Things are not symmetrical, so please avoid this. Please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and there's some things like the, the rabbit image where there is symmetry, but like I did is I broke up. I broke up the feet. Mm. You know, I, things, are, things are moving in perspective. Things are broken up. Each individual toe, those sorts of things can help you avoid symmetry. Even in a pose that's extreme and stretching like this, there's still drama in it. <clears throat> so then, you know, what another thing you can think about is what's going on underneath, which is like the skeleton. Get that, get that toe in there. You know, really pull back the leg here. I want to think about what's going on on the other side here. And pull that back. Get those feet in there. Don't hide your hands and feet in grass. But, oh my gosh. It's like when people draw human characters and always have them in their pockets. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, <laughs> I'm guilty of that in the beginning. Yeah? <laughs> totally hid those hands. Yeah, man. <laughs> always like, they're always like, hand, they're, they're, they get their hands behind their back. They got in their pockets. <laughs> Let's roll the head. But the big one, the big one with, with animal drawing, especially because like the animal's moving, you know, and at the zoo, they don't stop. And, you know, if it helps um, record um, some footage at the zoo of the animal moving, you know, everybody's, well, a lot of people have phones that allow, um, that have, a, that can record. So use that towards your advantage. Um, and you take it home, you look at your sketches, you can clean it up by using uh, references. Um, but what I like to do is just keep it as raw as I can when I'm on location and really observe. I actually bring binoculars with me when I want to do long watercolor paintings or long drawings. So binoculars are really helpful. Um, you can get one of those tripods where you set the binoculars up. It's a lot more, excuse me, it's a lot more stuff to uh, carry, but you know, it depends on it depends on what you want to do that day at the zoo or on location. If you're drawing wild animals, well, those guys are not going to come near you. <laughs> now, sometimes if you stay really quiet and really still, and the wind is in your favor, you'll get very lucky. You really see some neat stuff um, when you're out in the wild. Mm. I'll maybe make this a saber cat. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like saber cats. Those saber tooths. Yeah. I actually bought a. Uh, actually, my my husband got me a saber tooth um, saber tooth tiger uh, skull. 
from the Librea Tar Pits. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I named it Fluffy. <laughs> And uh, Jonathan, have you heard of the uh, the bone clowns mm. in uh, Los Angeles? No, I don't think so. What did you, can you say that name again? Bone clones. Bone clones. No, I have not. Oh my gosh! Um, when I was visiting uh, Los Angeles, I went to the CGMA office. Yeah. And after we were finished that day, um, Alex took me to Bone Clones. Uh huh. And I was, I flipped out. It's so cool. They have a showroom. I'm looking at it right uh, now. Wow. Oh. Dude, this is a gold mine. Yeah. <laughs> it's, oh. I was, oh, that place just blew my mind. Do you have to pay to get in? Or it's just like a huge... Well, what happened was I just... I decided, okay, let's go because I wanted to pick up a bear skull. And um, we went, and the lady was like, oh, usually we would like you to call ahead of time, but it's okay. So I think just calling ahead of time, just, just to be uh, polite. Uh, but the showroom just blew my freaking mind. <laughs> and um, I, got my, I got my black bear skull. They had finished it that day, actually. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, they have so many, so many different types of skeletons. Yeah, the the first thing I saw was the the big Ankoli Watusi bull skull they have on the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gosh, that I was like, okay, this place, um, I could stay here for like hours <laughs> and study. I could just, but unfortunately, it was like we caught them. Um, we caught them like an hour before they were closing, so I couldn't. Okay. I couldn't do too much studying. I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for telling me. I'm definitely gonna go check it out. It's in. Uh, oh yeah, do it. For those of you who are in do LA, it. it's in Canoga Park, and they open from eight to five. It's called Bone yeah, Clones. Just, yeah, just call them ahead of time. But I, at that place, I would drop so much money there if I had a credit card, which I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I only had cash on me. <laughs> Do you have any tips on drawing an, uh, birds on site? For example, birds a jay or a crow? Yeah, birds, uh, in my opinion, birds can be really great models. Um, when it comes to birds, like especially at a zoo, um, just observe where they like to sit and hang out, um, where they like to feed as well. Um, when you're working with like like a blue jay, um, you know, at a bird feeder, um, a lot of nature centers will have bird feeders, and they usually have binoculars that are available to the public. So, sitting there with your sketchbook, um, what you should do first is just Watch the animal. When, I, and when, when working with birds, I usually work with um, the basic, these basic shapes. Um, let, me just, uh, let me just take the cat out real quick. The basic shapes of birds, like I like to think about poses. And birds are really uh, quite simple in a way. You want to think of like a grilled chicken? <laughs> <laughs> I know it makes them it makes them seem less cool, but the the big shapes I think about are these like oval shapes with the with the birds. So like you want to think of the head, and you want to think of kind of these shapes going into space. And another thing you want to think about with the bird on location is the balance. So how does it balance itself? And this goes back again to the asymmetry. You know, you don't want the you don't want the legs, you know, like this. You want to you want to spread it out. Let me put the ankle up there. And these are these are like the basic shapes with the the birds. So here's the chicken thigh right here. This would be the pelvis region. Here's the other leg. 
Here's your, here's your KFC for anybody who likes that. <laughs> and the, the body of the bird is really quite stiff. This is, this is one big shape. There's not a lot of movement going on in the body region, okay? And with the head, there's a lot of movement. You know, you can get, you can get a nice long neck. It's usually a nice S shape like that. Pull that back. So this would be like a basic bird right here. This is what you're thinking of underneath. Really basic. Those feet in there. And then you want to put the feathers on top. You know, you want to think of the wing placement. And that scapular region is going to be up here. And then the wing is going to bend like so. And those feathers are going to make the bird look cooler. <laughs> <laughs> look less like a grilled chicken. And the one thing with birds is, some, like I said, sometimes they have their favorite spots where they like to just preen and hang out. And that's one thing with uh, a bird, even in the wild, like try to get to know where they, now where they do that. Like do they have a nest? Um, and if they have eggs in it or chicks, they'll sit there for a while. Do they have a favorite branch? Um, do they have a cliff they like to hang out on, like vultures? That kind of stuff. You know, really, really go out and look for that when you're on location. So then you want to think about the feathers, the tail. Pull the tail down, like right here. And the wings coming back. So this would be a nice uh, quick sketch. You know, if you need to go in and just fix up the length here, that's fine. You know, usually by now, like if you're if you're doing like a bird at a feeder, you know, it'll be moving. So be flexible when you're drawing birds. Like allow yourself to just stop with that sketch when you see a nice pose you like. You know, you can go in and start sketching the next pose. You know, you don't have to go through this process where you find everything, but these these two little uh, the head, the neck, and the body really simple. You know. And like I say, if it helps, do a lot of it. You know, the bird will move. And you think about that balance. And allow yourself, again, if that bird does something new, uh, start sketching it again down here. Want to just capture that really quick and get to know get to know a bird you really like like uh, you know images uh, research uh, some images because um, and uh, get get to know them like knowledge is power when it comes to animal drawing you know get to get get familiar with what the wing structure looks like of a crow or a raven or a jay blackbirds you know cardinals. You know, if it helps, do some studies from photographs before you go out on location. Uh, watch some videos on YouTube. So those are the big ones with uh, birds. Uh, just in animal drawing in general. So information, knowledge is power. And then you can impress your parents and your friends. Because <laughs> you'll know all these awesome scientific names. Oh, I so that's that's what I got. That's what I got on birds. Like here, it's, you know, pull out its wing. I have a specific <laughs> question. Um, in Joe Weatherly's DVD, he suggested to study volume by trying to find forms on animals' photos. Um, they're wondering uh, how do you include this step without being a prisoner by this process. Oh man, the uh, like the drawing 
like drawing over photographs or doing the uh, getting into the just doing basic shapes. Um, I, just to be a little bit more specific, I think I understand the question. Okay. Yeah. So I you're not just you're not just like doing this sort of thing. Correct. Like where you're just drawing these. Yes, correct. I believe that's the question. Okay. Oh. This is important. Um, understanding form is vital. Um, and I, I do agree where you, you, when you, you get caught up in this and all your animals look like these armatures, <laughs> you know? Um, my suggestion is um, because I come from a very different background uh, with art, um, I learned a lot about drawing through direct observation is uh, one, learn how to draw um, what is in front of you. So if you have a dog that's lying down, that really helps. Um, and one thing is practice this, but get to a point where it becomes absolute, it just, it's in your unconscious, where you don't even have to think about it. And, you know, for some it might take a while. Um, draw through, always draw through the drawing. Stay loose, stay fluid. Um, draw from life, don't just draw from photographs. That's, a, that's one thing I, I, I have noticed is when, you know, photographs are a great way to learn, but really get yourself to go and draw skeletons at a museum. Go draw skeletons, even like veterinarian, like parts and universities will allow you to do that. Um, there is also, um, pull up the, like the cat here, where things just are automatic, where you understand what's going on on the other side. Um, and really stay, stay loose. Stay loose. Don't, don't get into that, you know, where things are like this all the time. Again, it's important. It's important to understand attachment. It's important to understand the form. But you don't want things to end up oh God, looking like this. So going and drawing from life, um, I think, will really help with that. Uh, getting out and looking at stuff, looking at how it moves. You know, getting in and even like doing little sketches of movement like this. You know, like an animal sitting. But, you know, understanding where those core masses are and getting yourself to just draw through and staying loose. So I, I hope that helps um, to whoever asked it. Did it help? I'm awaiting the response. Okay. This is the... Yes. Just don't... They said it helped. Okay. Okay, yeah, just don't, just don't get stuck with the, that photograph stuff. Really, un go out and really, you know, another thing is uh, touch is a part of the learning process. And if you have a, a difficult time with a part of an animal, go into, like, a petting zoo. There's a lot of, a, like, the Munich Zoo has a petting zoo. And touching an animal really helps, and that will help you understand form. And that's a, that's a big one. It's like with photographs, you're just looking at this photograph. But if, you, if you're able to go and, like, pet horses, you know, touch them. And if you're lucky, maybe you can go in and really, I don't know, the owner might let you groom a horse if you're curious enough. Um, and that's, that's the big one is just touch. I, a lot of people forget that. And, you know, with animals... You know, you pet your dog, you pet your cat, you, you got a horse. You Like when I was a kid, I, there were a lot of cows um, where I grew up. And I would visit those cows like once a week. Um, um, unfortunately, I actually stood on the fence too much where there was an apple tree and the cows got loose around the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, um, my dad subtly told me not to stand on the fence after he had to go chase the cows. <laughs> I kind of put two and two together, so yeah. But uh, yeah, it's 
I, I understand with, with this. This is important. It's important to get those armatures. It's important to understand how things connect. But that's not, that's not what you're wanting to do. And over time, this, this will become automatic. Do you have any tips on animal characteristics? Um, knowing the foundations and drawing a dog from life, uh, like it doesn't, like so that it looks like that specific one? Yeah, that one, that one, you can, if you have a dog or a cat, you, you understand like quirks, you understand who they are. And you have two cats, you can differentiate between the two. You know, either by the way they look, uh, fur patterns, age is important uh, to remember. Um, to the breed as well. Uh, the sex also helps male, female. Um, those are the things you want to consider uh, when you're thinking about drawing an uh, individual animal. Uh, getting down to the core of it, you know, really writing down stuff actually does help. Um, I do write things down when I'm going in and doing an individual animal. And I'll write stuff off to the side on my sketchbook. And I do this for character design as well. It really helps. Again, it's, it's the way I learn. And it's not just through visual, it's through language. And I need both. So it's important uh, learn uh, learn how you learn to learn how you learn. Um, and Funny enough, I learned how I learned when I got out of school. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was taught a lot of great things in school, but I needed to really find out how I did this, how my, what my process is. And uh, so writing down notes, um, and all of those things go into consideration. And you look at, you look at different huskies. You know, and you see different fur patterns. You look at different types of deer, and you see, like, this is a white-tailed deer. This is a mule deer. Um, you see that the buck, um, let me pull up, a, pull up another image here. I'll just full screen this. The, like the, oh my. I, whoops, my bad. Let's do that again. There we go. Gosh. I can Photoshop today. The like, I know, <laughs> like in in the fall of in, in the winter during the rut season, white-tailed deer um, and deer in the rut, they have like a buck actually has a much more of a square head than the female. The female has a much rounder head. Why? Because they've got the antlers. And the big one with like with deer, and this is just this is one of the things is why I learned this is because um, I really like white-tailed deer. I think they're beautiful animals. I used to hunt them when I was in Missouri. They're abundant. And the big one is like with white tails, you have the you have the head, and you have the antlers up here. And during the rut season, the neck gets really thick, like really thick because the bucks are full of testosterone. And that's, that's one of those things is that will help you differentiate between gender. You have antlers. You have also a buck that is he's ready to roll, man. This guy is ready to get some ladies. <laughs> and he, he, you will see uh, with white tails when the dominant buck walks in, all of the other little teenager bucks get out of the way. Those guys are trying to show up to the ladies. Oh man, look at my eight points! And when this big boy comes in, you know he might have a drop time. He's been around for a long time. Thick, thick antlers. You know, widespread you know, whatever. When he walks in, the other ones get out of the way. And that's the same you think about uh, cattle. And I've seen it with cattle. Um, 
when a when a female is in heat, when that steer comes in, the other the other little guys get out of the way. So it's it's those types of things that will really help you draw those individuals. Um, again, it's that it's that knowledge is power, you know, and getting getting to know animals as well. Um, and you'll see individual characteristics at the zoo. You'll see the ones that don't give a crap about you when you come in. You'll see the ones um, that are curious. You'll see the difference between, again, age. You'll see the difference between sex, either it's patterns, you know, it's in the way the neck, how thick the neck is, um, that sort of thing. So that, that can give you a basis uh, when you're drawing uh, an individual. So that's my that's my white tailed deer lecture. <laughs> that's really insightful. <laughs> but again, it's the reason why I know this stuff is you I was out in nature learning it. Um, when I got home from a hunt, I would read about it to understand, you know. It's 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 just one of those things that interest. It's the, the curiosity is what drives me to learn. Mm -hmm. Right. Is there a place where you can find out about jobs that need animal art? Um, definitely check out conservation magazines, <laughs> um, especially in your state. Um, wherever you're from, there are also uh, hunting magazines, uh, fishing magazines are possible like in Fisherman. One of the guys, uh, his name Larry Topple, uh, he, he inspired me when I was a kid. That guy blew my mind with his fishing illustrations. Ah, oh. and it's like when I when I got the new in Fisherman every month, um, I just was blown away with his illustrations. Um, the like hunting magazines will need stuff uh, again. Conservationists, uh, zoos. That's always a good one. You know, if you got some good work and they're doing, they're starting to redo the signs, you can go in and talk to them. Um, also, just conservation, like the conservation department, sometimes they need uh, really nice illustrations for uh, their displays. Um, museums as well, they'll have people come in and do illustrations. So there's a lot of possibilities. Um, of course, animation, video games. Um, People, you know, I've worked with the Bournemouth University students in the United Kingdom. I've worked with uh, students that need help with the creature design, uh, but also just with animals. Uh, so that's another possibility, well, excuse me, possibility is mentoring as well. Excuse me. <laughs> Had about five words come out at once. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that's a, there's a lot of possibilities with uh, with animal art. Um, you can even combine it with creature designs as well. Uh, books, oh my gosh, books. They, they <laughs> a lot of nature books, uh, animal books, bird books. Especially if you're really good at birds, um, the uh, those bird plates you see, um, and how to identify birds. All those. People are needed for that as well. You can get really creative and um, have a lot of fun with kind of searching out people, searching out studios, uh, looking for uh, new possibilities, where to work, and stuff like that. Do you find that sculpting animals helps in regards to improving drawing? Yes, I do. I don't pursue sculpting so much, um, but I do have models, uh, anatomy models, and they, because again, the touch, it has helped me so much. Um, if you just mess around a little bit, say if you're, if you're needing to get lighting on an extinct animal, um, a dinosaur or something, just doing a little sculpt of the head or the body and the pose can be incredibly helpful. Um, so you get 
you get to touch it and you get to see how the lighting affects the, the form. And that definitely, yes, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, definitely, again, touch is very important. So I go in. Thinking about a little bit of shading here. So we're coming to the end. I'm just going to ask you two more questions. Um, yeah. What was your first commission, and how did it happen? Uh, when they like I got to know the freelance. Yeah, they like to know the freelancing process as an animal drawer. Um, my first commission. <laughs> when I got out of university, I did logos, man, and it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I do not like. But it was a job, and I needed money, and you just got to do it sometimes, you know? And I did it, and I got through it. Um, when it came to, like, the first commissions, um, I would work on little concepts for, like, video games, like a creature stuff, or like in oh, uh, tea poses, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, the big one, like the first big one was the Munich Zoo. Um, and they, the thing was, is the director, the CEO, asked me to just do what I do. Uh, go on location and sketch the animals we want. He liked what I did when I did it from life. And the first job I got was with the, uh, the venomous snakes at the Munich Zoo. And the big one was uh, getting, well, I could probably just do it on that later, but... Um, for me, when I approach drawing an animal, say like a, a snake, um, the big one was is I start out with the basic shapes of the head. You know, I'd get that nice shape of the head right there, pull this down, and get that form. And again, for the zoo, it was quite special because they asked me to just be myself. And that was, that is what you really want. Um, so I would just go and I would sketch snakes on location. And I sketched all of the snakes they had um, at, the, at their aquarium. And they had green mambas. Um, they still have them. They've got the gaboon viper. They've got, those gaboon vipers are gorgeous when they shed their skin, by the way. Oh, my gosh. It's like, it's like jewelry to me. <laughs> they've got the, um, they've also got like the, uh, they've got a rattlesnake, they've got a, a cobra, so I got to learn about those animals. Um, and I usually do research. That's a big one is research. Um, collect photographs, read about them. Um, and with the, with the Munich Zoo, they wanted, like, okay, we want the cobra, uh, draw the head of the cobra so you, you can tell that this is this particular cobra. Um, could you show the uh, rattlesnakes a uh, little uh, rattle? You know, stuff like that. So that's what I, those are the types of things. Learn for, for commission, you of course want to please the client. And what are the specs? Um, and a big one I do, and that has helped me immensely, is I print out the email because it helps me keep it clear what the client wants. And I refer to that email, you know, a few times when I'm going through the research process. What is it that I need from this uh, image? What is it that I need to do? So just so it keeps, it keeps me very on, a, on a very clear path instead of me going off and I'm like, oh, I'm going to go do something else amazing. You know, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't, if they go, don't surprise the client. <laughs> uh, that, that can be bad, actually. Yeah, that, uh, but printing things out, um, research, um, understanding the specs, uh, doing thumbnail sketches, of course, um, illustration, if you're doing an illustration, you usually want to see uh, thumbnails, and, you know, making them clear. Again, with the sloth, there was some confusion, um, because this sketch wasn't clear for them, 
And for me, next time I work on a do not touch an animal, do not feed an animal sign, I'll make the sketch with more clarity. Um, so that's a big one. Communicate as well. This, guys, write emails. Don't just be like, hey, what's up, bro? What's going on? You know, clients don't talk like that. <laughs> Hey man, lol, you know, be a professional about it, okay? Um, it's so communicate. Be able to write a proper email with grammar, with periods and commas in the right place, okay? <laughs> okay the, you know, don't write like you're writing to your friends on Skype or on Facebook. You know, unless of course you're writing with you know, grammatically correct sentences. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it, that's a big one. I know it's it's kind of silly, but it really does make a difference. So being professional, being able to communicate, and this does mean writing emails, but also calling clients. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call them. Mm -hmm. That's. The one thing with the Missouri Department of Conservation, when I sent off my contract, it actually got there late because I was watching the tracking number. I'm from Germany. You know, stuff happens. So I called the art director one day to tell him. Hmm. Just so, hey, this is what's going on. I'm really sorry about if there's any inconvenience. He's like, yeah, no problem. Just thank you so much for letting me know, though. And I didn't end up losing my arm over it, you know? Right. So it's just communicate, guys. That's, that's a really big one. Um, and that is a part of the process, is communication. And there will be illustrations and times when the client goes, okay, this was not clear enough. You know, could you do this a little bit more with more clarity, you know, whatever, more clarity. So you're going to get things returned to you, returned to you, or you're going to get things where you turn it in and the client's like, hey, this looks great. Thank you so much. Write the bill. And a part of the process as a freelancer is writing a bill. <laughs> Don't forget to write the bill. That's great information. Um, we're going to... <laughs> yeah, we're going to be coming to an end now, so do you have anything else you want to address before we close? Um, just be curious about the world around you. Don't lose that. Mm. Be able to allow yourself to learn, allow yourself to even go, hey, I don't know. That's okay. That's awesome. That's good. Yeah, just... Just be okay with that. You're not going to die. Well, unless you don't know if you're going to go into a bear cave and the bear's there. That's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would suck. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> but, yeah. All yeah, right. that's... Uh, well, thank you so yeah, much, so everyone. This is like, oh, yeah, yeah sorry. Ahead, this ahead. is what the snakes were like at the Munich Zoo. Um, just the, the starting out on the structure of the heads and stuff. And then you go into more detail. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, remember to check out Shannon's class. Uh, registration is still open. And um, thank you so much, Shannon. I actually learned a lot from you today, too. Uh, oh, it was pretty awesome good talking sauce. to you. It was a pleasure meeting you, Jonathan. Yes, pleasure as well. We'll have to, we'll have to grab a couple beers in L.A. sometime. Oh, I'm down for that. Sounds good. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone, for joining. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And um, this will be on YouTube later if you guys want to recap on anything. So, yes. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> All, All right. right. Take care, everybody. Yeah, I'll talk to you later. Ciao. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.